Today, we're looking at the new 2022 or 2023 same bike, Giant Trance Advanced Pro 29.2. So I just said this is the same bike between 2022 and 2023. The only difference being that this is a 2022 and that is a very gray, sparkly gray. The new version will be a color that they call Air Glow, which I think is getting into Giant's um, classic sort of chameleon color that they like. This particular color is called Metal. So there's one reason to love this bike. In today's video, we're gonna go over the specifications on this bike. Um, basically a bit about its background, some of the uh, details, highlights, sizing, low lights if we can track it down, and in general we will be talking about this Trans Advanced Pro 29.2, a carbon fiber 120mm rear travel, 130mm fork bike that I am kind of oozing in excitement over, so we're going to talk about this bike. So we'll get some of the house cleaning out of the way. This bike is 31.6 pounds um, stock out of the box with the tires set up tubeless, tubeless goop in the tires and without pedals. I do have pedals on here because tomorrow morning I want to take this thing out for a rip. This is a few hours after we uh, closed the shop on a Thursday night and tomorrow the weather is supposed to be good and I want to ride this bike so bad that I will just call it my own or something. Um, so hopefully that gives a little bit of an idea about the kind of excitement when a bike shop owner gets super excited about something. Um, so housekeeping is 31.6 pounds. Uh, this 2022 in Canada is $57.99 Canadian dollars. The 2023, as I mentioned, same bike, slightly different color, but still kind of um, a very uh, similar appearance, just you would see in this kind of light as I did this with the new color, you would probably see some of the sparkles of uh, kind of fading from gray to blue to purpley, something like that. That's what I'm anticipating. We're still a couple weeks away from seeing our first 2023s. The weird thing, if you happen to be watching or watching this, but you live in the States, this same bike, the same name, Giant Trans Advanced Pro 29.2, your version has all the same spec, but you would see a thing mounted here and you would see some extra wires going in here because the US version of both, well, they don't even distinguish between 22 and 23, they're putting a Fox Live valve on this level of bike. And if I recall correctly, that is going for 6,000 bucks US. So with the exception of when I talk about the suspension on this thing, everything else basically about the spec on this bike is going to be similar between your US electronic uh, suspension version and our Canadian version being standard suspension. Um, we often see shared uh, model choices in Canada, Australia, New Zealand. So maybe somebody, if you're watching in Australia or, or New Zealand, if you know, uh, let people know in the comments what version it is that you're getting. I will just say right now, and I'm actually kind of scared to say this, I will say right now I'm not a fan of Live Valve. I'm scared to say it because Two of our brands, uh, Giant and Pivot, are big fans of Live Valve. I'm not a fan, but it's not to say that it's bad. It's to say that there are things about suspension and the way I set up my suspension that I just don't want an uh, extra extraneous random adjustment happening on my suspension. Um, and that's a little bit to do with how I tend to ride my bikes. So we have some housekeeping out of the way. Um, if you're new here, my name is Graham. I own a bike shop in Cochrane, Alberta, Canada. That is the channel name, Bike Bros. That's the name of our shop. And what I like to do is film these bikes, show you some close-ups, some of the details that almost never make it into reviews, whether they're in print or online or in videos. Um, so you get to know some of those details I point out some of the things that you would just find interesting, like this is if this is on your shopping list, 
you probably want to keep watching because you're going to learn something that you um, most certainly without taking a microscope and spending an hour in a shop and talking to the mechanics that have built the bike, you're going to find out some stuff. That's kind of the MO of this channel. So hang out for a bit and we're going to go deep on this one. So on this bike, I'm going to go over the uh, specifications. I'm going to do it a little bit uh, quicker than I do in some of the other videos because I think the specs, if you're interested in this level of bike, you probably know spec, you know why SLX is going to be better or worse than something else. Um, I'll go over it, I'll touch on the stuff or spend more time on the stuff that, uh, that is unique or may um, not be obvious. So to start with, we have a Shimano SLX uh, rear derailleur. Of course, it's a clutched rear derailleur. Um, I hope I don't have to explain the clutch and what it's doing for you. An SLX cassette, um, so that's a 12-speed drivetrain. SLX cassette means we're starting at 10 teeth, going up to 51 teeth. So enough range of gears that uh, it should be able to get most riders um, in or out of trouble as needed. Uh, it does use the um, sort of SRAM designed UDH derailleur hanger. So if something happens on a road trip and you destroy a derailleur hanger, um, it is a UDH derailleur hanger, which just means that it's uh, going to be about as universal a derailleur hanger as you can ask for. We have some nice chainstay protection. If you didn't catch it earlier, this is when Giant talks about an advanced pro frame. Advanced means we're talking about carbon fiber. Pro in general is going to mean on their full suspension bikes that in addition to carbon fiber there, we're going to get a carbon fiber uh, rocker link as well as carbon fiber on the rear end. So the distinction there lies more back to a, two generations ago when a trance was only in a 27.5 bike and rear ends in that case were um, virtually always aluminum. So now that we're into pro, uh, carbon fiber, carbon fiber, carbon fiber. And if you don't know, Giant is the world's biggest uh, bike manufacturer. They build bikes for a number of other companies. Who those companies are, um, they try to keep secret, but we know that Trek, Colnago, um, some Scots, though not their carbon fiber, if my understanding is correct, and maybe even some uh, other California brands that all the cool guys want have come out of the Giant factory over the years. So one of their big things when they're talking about carbon fiber manufacturing is the Giant factory will actually go as far as starting with carbon fiber thread and then they do their own job of turning that into uh, pre-pregnated sheets of carbon fiber to their own specifications and then all of the molding, all of the stuff that goes into a frame. So when it comes to carbon, uh, Giant is probably the most vertically oriented, whatever you would call that in business terms. They go everything from a fiber of carbon to this, and that takes an incredible amount of technology and knowledge. So they, when they want to flex their muscles, Giant can easily build something as good or better than virtually anything out there. So sorry, that was me digressing back, just wanted to explain the carbon fiber deal on Giants and just how good it is and why you should have some reason to believe in Giants carbon. It also brings up the discussion we sometimes hear and some other shops will use this against Giant is they, um, other shops that don't sell Giant or even ones that do but they want to sell other higher end branded bikes, they will leave you with a shadow of doubt in your mind by saying something like, oh, those giants, they're such a good value. Um, I wonder what they do to save you that sort of money. Um, there is nothing, if you pull these things apart, if you assemble them, a giant is not a cheaper bike. There aren't bad bearings somewhere. There isn't bad manufacturing anywhere. It is purely a case that giant, by being the manufacturer, by building their own product, they have the ability to make high-end product and they're not greedy, so they just pass along a fair price to you. 
So in a case like this, when we look at all the spec on this bike, a full carbon bike with carbon rims, and it is 5,800-ish bucks in Canada, and you say, how do they do it? It's like, well, they do it like that, or they can do it like that, because they feel like it, uh, not because they are putting in garbage carbon or anything else. Very high-end stuff and absolutely worthy of respect. So we carry on with the spec. We go from that drivetrain. We have a KMC chain. Some people do, some people don't like them. They're fine. A 30 tooth uh, narrow wide Shimano chain ring. This crank set is roughly the equivalent of a Dior crank set, just a half a, sh a smidgen lower in their lineup, uh, and it doesn't say Dior on it. But still, as we can see with that hollow right there, it's a hollow tech 2 crank set. It's got good bearings, good bottom bracket, um, good manufacturing, all that sort of stuff. It's something that I would be shocked if anybody got this and if they had complaints about the quality of, uh, of their cranks. The bike that we're looking at here is a size large and these cranks are 170 millimeters. So uh, that is kind of the trend, especially on longer travel bikes these days, is not to go up into the 175 sort of length. And that is partially to do with trying to reduce the likelihood of pedal strikes. Um, when your pedal hits the ground, especially under suspension compression. We have some pretty nicely done uh, cable routing um, disappearing inside the chain stay here, integrated with that protection, coming back out there with a little protective sleeve over the housing for a section. Uh, zip tied onto the bottom Maestro link coming out of, this is a new style of port that uh, Giant is using in this case, all pretty clean. We have some nice quality looking pivot bolts. One thing you will notice on here, so the Maestro suspension being one of the things that makes Giant just a very, very good suspension design, um, is also the fact that we just have one, two, three, four, five different links there. Um, or pivot points, because in many cases, this bottom here, sharing the mount for the uh, bottom link of the Maestro, is also the bottom mount of the shock. So five instead of six potential bearings to replace. And speaking of bearing replacement, one thing that Giant is very well known for is their bearings tend to last. Um, we see bikes come in that have had like a hard five, six, seven years of use. And you maybe start to get a little bit notchy down here. Um, but in many cases, uh, the, the giant suspension bearings, pivots, tends to uh, outlast a lot of other stuff that's out there. The wheels on this bike are the giant TRX2 wheels. So the rim is giant's in-house built 30 millimeter wide TRX rim that is carbon fiber, 30 mil wide internal, so um, the material and the dimension that would be very popular. Um, and then of course tubeless ready and the bike comes all set up tubeless. We just put the sealant in and inflate the tires and then they're good to go. Tires on the rear, Maxxis Aggressor 29 by 2.5, a nice big tire which I like to see, and an XO casing and of course tubeless ready or we wouldn't be able to do that tubeless thing. I am looking forward to getting to try an aggressor finally. This is one tire that has been kind of near the top of my I'm interested in list for tires and I've just never actually gotten one on a bike so I look forward to trying that out. Stepping ahead of that rear tire we see this is one of the changes on this 2022 um, the 2021 version of this bike was different. This, the, in 2022, this was released. As part of the release, it has the flip chip in there. That flip chip will adjust your seat tube angle and head tube angle by about 0.7 degrees. Um, so in the moment when that pivot is at the upper end of the flip chip, that is the low position. 
When we flip it around and put that pivot down lower, it'll be in the higher position. I will likely end up riding this in the higher position uh, myself because I prefer to keep my bottom bracket on the higher end of things and I like a steeper seat tube angle. I appreciate it more than I really care about 0.7 degrees of head tube angle. The spike is going to rock either way you do it. Um, I'll show you a little bit more about the distinctive sort of frame shape here. When this this sort of shape first came out on the Trance X, which was released a year before this, it stood out a little bit, but now that I've seen more things like Forbiddens that share this same kind of fat bit here, um, where the seat tube and top tube meet up, I think it's becoming just a thing that uh, looks normal in our mind. So. Uh, Kind of distinctive, but also can't be that distinctive if it's uh, very common. One of those very new things that came with that flip chip is also the addition of the storage door on here. So we have a pretty simple little um, turn knob on here that gets turned 90 degrees and you get to pull that off. The water bottle bolts um, are attached to that, which seems to be the common way of doing it. And so far from asking around with a little bit of concern, I haven't heard of anybody having rattling noise or anything once you get a, a full water bottle uh, mounted on here. So that's something that I hope to prove to myself once I actually get to ride it. Inside here, um, fresh out of the box, there is a plastic bag. Inside the plastic bag is like a just a padded bag to basically allow you to put stuff in here and not have it disappear down into the bottom of the down tube. Um, we have had cases now with, uh, off the top of my head, somebody in the shop getting a Trek serviced and one of our guys had to spend like half an hour shaking all of the crud that had gone all the way down into the bottom of that Trek frame. So that little bag there is gonna help you to uh, not have stuff disappear. And closing it is as easy as that. You get a nice solid sound and feel to the knock. No reason to believe that we will have uh, any sort of crazy noises happening there. Going ahead, we come to our Hyundai Elantra part of this. And I don't say that uh, in a mean way. I actually find this uh, top tube, down tube, head tube, junction here to be super sexy. It just reminds me of some of the cars out there that have uh, sort of molded shapes in there. Um, it brings up the fact that a lot of the frames, if you don't see a lot of this stuff happening up here, what I think happens in some of the uh, China carbon factories is this unit, basically the head tube and where a stump would stick out for down tube and top tube, I think that that in some cases is an off the shelf part that some companies, other companies other than Giant might share because you do see a lot of really similar kind of plain Jane um, junctions happening up there. That's just a theory, but I think with what I know about how some of the carbon frames are made, that that might be an off the shelf part that, uh, that some brands choose to use. This is about the only Place that we really see Giant um, proudly displayed on the frame. So it's a real like low key kind of a bike. Um, yeah, I would personally be even more proud to have Giant on this down tube because I think it's like, look at that profile. That is a hot looking frame. Uh, I'll just show you on that US version. This is where the battery portion um, battery, controller, CPU, mainframe, I don't know what it is on a, a Fox Live valve, but you'd see in all the pictures a little square sticking out there and that is where that uh, live valve stuff would mount. The rear shock itself is a Fox DPS um, EVOL, um, so a slightly larger can on here than the non-EVOL ones. And of course on these, the blue lever that's trail set or in open mode, so that's gonna be plushest. Straight down will be your trail setting. To the right will be your firm setting. I personally, being a fan of Giant, part of why I'm a fan is because 
I don't like to have to remember dials and I find Maestro pedals well enough. I park all my bikes in open mode, set my air pressure and my rebound, this red thing, correctly, and I just ride it up and down in that mode and I don't ever worry about that switch, which would come to, in my criticism of the big pushing of live valve on Giant's bikes, I wonder, I sort of see live valve as being a potential band-aid for a not so great suspension design. And I personally think Maestro suspension is one of the best designs out there. You get incredible traction, braking, um, active suspension and efficiency. Why would you need to hook up something that adds complexity batteries and wires if you are already building a bike with one of the best suspension designs out there. So in my very quick touching on my lack of love for the live valve, that will be one of my arguments. So please, if somebody from Giant watches this, don't cut me off as a dealer because I don't like live valve. My lack of interest in live valve is because you already make one of the best suspension designs out there, Giant. Um, we touched on that, tires, tubeless setup. It's already got the goop in there. Now that I built this bike earlier today, we sweep forward past that non-Dior, Dior-ish type of a crank. We see some new uh, ports with a little screw thing there, not just a rubber doohickey that gets shoved inside. The fork is a Fox Rhythm. So a Rhythm is a 34 mil stanchion, um, the equivalent of a Fox 34 performance performance fork because it has a grip damper, air on that side, 34 mil stanchions. The only thing that changes on this fork is the shape of the crown um, and then coincidentally along with it, it is a slightly heavier fork than a traditional Fox 34, but otherwise it's a Fox 34 that uh, maybe has like two extra ounces of weight. We come around the front tire, Minion DHF, once again, 29 by 2.5. It's that same rim that's on here that I mentioned. Um, 2.5 as well here, EXO casing. Uh, so I think the only thing I would point on, out on this bike right off the bat that I would be interested in seeing is an EXO plus on the rear to still keep the weight down, but to just give you a little bit more meat on your tire on the rear end. As we get to these brakes, they're on six bolt rotors and I will point out that this is one of the few things in assembling this bike that I was a bit bummed to see. The rotors are 180 millimeters front and rear. These are resin only rotors, meaning these are basically the, uh, from the budget basement budget shop from Shimano. Um, and that means that there's also gonna be resin pads in these brakes, even though they're a four piston brake. So 180 mil rotors, the one place that you would potentially want to upgrade this bike would be in braking, and that would be getting new rotors, sticking some new uh, metallic brake pads in there. Keep in mind though, these resin pads at lower speeds are probably gonna have better bite and they're gonna sound better. So uh, it's not always a case of metallic is better. Metal is better, but not metallic. And I'm talking about metal as the frame color. These brakes are the 6000 series brakes. That means that they are the first price point to have servo wave, which is sort of a mechanical thing happening up in the lever body up here that allows for this shorter brake lever and still the really good power that uh, Shimano's, Shimano brakes are known for. So I'm a fan of these brakes because at a pretty decent price point, like aftermarket, half the price of XTs, you pretty much get XT performance potentially out of the brakes. You just don't get the uh, tool-free adjustment on things, which it's not that hard to pull a tool out. Uh, you don't get a reach adjust little screw that would be up here that would be on XT, um, but you do get uh, ceramic, Pistons in your brakes. You can't see them in there, but there are ceramic pistons. That helps to dissipate the heat. 
you get the servo wave, so you get the two magical things that the higher end Shimano brakes get, but at a price point. That bell I put on, that's the Easter egg, just to see if anybody's paying attention now that I've pointed it out. You know about it. Uh, the grips are giant lock-ons, a decent pattern on there. Uh, doesn't really do much for me, positive or negative. The handlebars are an alloy 780 millimeter wide uh, giant contact trail bar with 35 mil clamp. So they might be a little bit on the uh, stiff side, maybe transmit a bit of extra shock into your hands. The stem is 50 millimeters long, which I think for this 120, 130 millimeter travel bike is probably going to keep it handling the ups and downs pretty appropriately. We do not have to put 32 mil stems on everything we ride. Uh, what else can we point out? Uh, dropper courtesy of this new uh, travel adjust, we'll just call it the plus rad. Um, this is, I believe, a 170 to 200 mil drop range on this particular bike. It has a pretty pleasing and strong, oh, let's see if I can do this while I'm doing it. Listen to that. That's a pretty nice dropper thunk at the top of its stroke. Going back to some details, we do have some shuttle protection with that sort of see-through 3M type stuff up around the top. And then that stops right about there. And then we go back down into some rock protection as we go around the belly of the down tube. We come around here, just show you that close up of how that Maestro linkage looks. The rear end on this, once again, it's a 180 millimeter rotor front and back. Um, I will, now that I'm on this side of the bike, point out that is a giant branded hub on this one. On the TRX2s, one thing I would say is the giant hub is not exactly high engagement. While I don't buy into um, getting super transfixed by high engagement, I do appreciate high-end hubs. So for all of this is a $5,800 bike with functionally a killer pile of parts, even though none of them um, are ones that you would have friends ooing and awing over. For function, this bike top to bottom for sub six grand Canadian bike is about as solid a build as you can possibly get. The only potential misgiving I would have, um, just because I don't know the longevity of this particular hub that they use, um, would be the rear hub. Uh, for those who, I don't know if I mentioned it before in a previous video, I have broken my pelvis because of a rear hub blowing up, so I am extremely conscientious of rear hub quality. And while that was an extremely rare event, uh, just about everything I've ridden since my broken pelvis days has been either a DT Swiss star ratchet hub or uh, I-9 hubs. So this touches on, oh, I'll show you one last thing. That's the Giant Romero saddle. I'm a big fan of that saddle. It feels good. It's got a little bit of a uh, scoop to it. It, uh, for a stock saddle, I am a fan. It doesn't look exciting, but it feels quite good. Uh, so that's the wrap up of the specs. I'm gonna go into next some of the things about what changed from the previous model, why this model uh, basically slid totally under the radar. Um, it almost didn't get any fanfare announcements, anything with its release. Um, it had some pretty horrible timing, I think. There was something going on in the world. Uh, and yeah, so Geo, that, and a little bit of a talk about uh, plans I might have with this bike myself. So, geometry numbers. Uh, I'm going to give you the, uh, the uh, sort of numbers. Because this thing has a flip chip on it, it means that there is a range of two different numbers for a whole bunch of these measurements. I will sum it up with the sort of things that make it easy to understand. On a size large, 77 degree seat tube angle which, especially for a short travel bike, is on the steep end of things. 
I am very long-legged. That is my seat height right there. Um, you can imagine how long my legs are to make that work. If seat angles are much slacker than 76 degrees for me, I feel like I'm riding in the back seat. So for me, being a long-legged, short torso person, 77 degree seat tube angle is pretty darn sweet spot-ish. Head tube angle ranges in the 66 plus or minus kind of range. Um, so a very suitably slack, yet not so slack that you're gonna be riding like a drunk rider when trying to do climbing trails. Um, also, this bike here, I'm gonna be calling it a bike very suitable for marathon long days in the saddle. Um, and there's a couple things here. Between that pretty slack, but not overly slack, head tube, and also a, a new longer rear end, and longer than some of the contemporaries, some of the things uh, from Niner, from Pivot even, that uh, I've looked at. The rear end on this bike, 438 millimeter chain stays. So between those two things, I think this means that you can get really tired while out on a trail, and you're not gonna have to pay super attention to your body positioning to still feel centered and to not have a front wheel washout. So I am in my head building this up as a very competent um, trail bike, if not in its mode right now, which I think I could easily go race seven days on this thing. Um, we'll see how this thing ends up, but I think that geometry wise, this really does put you in a spot where you'll be able to climb about as well as anybody, descend probably better than anybody else in the marathon field. Um, and that's partially because you would be riding a bit heavier bike than anybody else. But also I think the geo on this bike just puts you in a position that you can get aggressive on the downs and you can still be a little bit tired and not have your ass handed to you. We have a little bit of a taller stack than the previous version. Um, so that just means your handlebars are gonna be a touch higher. That also adds to that not having to be like 100% on your A-game to uh, still have a good time and go fast on a long, long ride. So those are some of the, uh, the things to consider on here. I should say this large reach ranges from 472 to 480 millimeters. Um, that is going to be another temptation to ride this in the high mode, not in the slack mode, because I will probably be wanting um, a little bit of a longer reach. I like that 480, 485 is my sweet spot, so I can get into that zone by riding this in the, uh, in the not slack mode. So now I'm going to touch on this bike and its unfortunate release during COVID. And that's for a couple reasons. A, everybody was distracted by a lot of things. I think that there was a lot of press that just never happened because of this being released at the same time as huge parts shortages, um, hiccups in the supply chain, and just that the fact that uh, how do you get a whole bunch of media people together uh, to have a look at this thing like they usually would. So I think that this thing suffered from that fact uh, because between geometry this particular build, its spec, those things all add up to a bike that should have received a bit more recognition, should have been in something like Pink Bike's downcountry test. And one last thing is that this is the only of these bikes in Canada that came without live valve. And then in the States, they released three versions of which only the top end didn't come with live valve. And so, in Giant's releasing of this bike, when they got press, there was often way more time in the video reviews, magazine reviews, talking about live valve and the yays or nays of that, rather than focusing on the, back, the, the fact that this thing between its Maestro suspension, the carbon frame, the flip chip, the geometry, like this bike stands on its own. It should be a super exciting bike for a lot of people. Like I personally think a 120, 130 bike is about where a lot of people probably should be to have the funnest time. Um, and yet this bike just got eclipsed by the fact that it was never mentioned without mentioning electronics happening on its suspension. So 
Who's sick of my voice? I'm already starting to lose it from talking this long, but I think this bike, it deserves a lot of discussion. The last thing I'm gonna tell you is, I, um, I'm signed up for the BC Bike Race. That's a seven day race all on Vancouver Island this year. And this is one of two bikes that is now my short list of bikes that I might be racing that on. I am very fortunate being a shop owner that I can basically play with expensive bikes. I get them at shop owner deals and then uh, be it a few weeks, a few months later, I sell them off and so I get to try a lot of things. And with that said, this is one of the two bikes that I am considering for that bike. I went with this particular model, uh, partially as mentioned, not a fan of live valve. I think I could race this in its stock setup, like absolutely stock. But part of what I'm thinking on this is this frame, I just find it to be so sexy that I am not gonna be able to hold back from blinging out parts that are perfectly functional on this bike just for the sake of blinging it out. Um, I don't know if that means anything to people, but for me, I think there is a sexiness to this bike, a worthiness when you're sitting there looking at these carbon wheels and you're thinking, I'm gonna buy some fancy carbon wheels or looking at this fork or this cockpit, these cranks, any of this stuff may very well end up getting replaced only because I think this frame deserves absolute bomber bike parts and it is always fun to personalize a bike in that way. So I'm Graham. We've been talking about this 2022, which is also a 2023 in a slightly different color. Giant Trans Advanced Pro 29.2. As Giants always do, it has a stupidly long name, but as they always do, you get value and you get amazing value. Um, amazing value and value. Uh, value and performance. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more of these sorts of videos, subscribe, like, leave a comment, all that stuff that people tell you to do on videos, um, and we will see you again soon. Thanks so much for watching. Ciao.